Hi, my name is Jack Spirico. I am the host of the Survival Podcast. If you're watching this video, it's probably because of your opinion, positive or negative, about the use of a drug called hydroxychloroquine uh, as it regards the treatment of COVID SARS 2, commonly referred to in the media, albeit incorrectly, as COVID 19, which is actually the disease, the late stage of the disease that results from the infection of the virus known as COVID SARS 2. Anyway, um, I am, instead of going to make a case, I'm going to ask some questions. These are very sincere questions. And please understand if you're watching this video that I talk to about a quarter million people a day with my podcast and everything that I think about this, I've already told them. And if I'm wrong, if I'm actually wrong, if you can show me with data that I'm wrong, if you can prove to me with science that I'm wrong, I want you to tell me and I want you to show me and I want you to fairly answer the questions that I'm going to ask you now. If you don't feel qualified to answer them, a lot of people that seem to have big opinions about this say they have doctors and nurses and people in their family who tell them these things and therefore they know that they're true. Please go get them. Have them answer. I have 14 questions. I'm about to ask them. And I would just like them answered by anybody with intellectual honesty. And again, I don't want to give bad information. I, and again, I talk to a quarter million people a day. If I've given them bad information, I would very much appreciate the opportunity to correct that. So here's my questions. Number one, did you know what the recommended dosage was for hydroxychloroquine for COVID uh, SARS-2 patients as outpatients early on in the illness before they develop severe symptoms and end up in an ER? Do you know what the recommended dosage for those people is? The recommended dosage is... 400 milligrams a day on day one, and 200 milligrams for four days, and then stop. It's five days and you're done. So I'm giving you the answer to that one, but I'm giving you the answer to that one because it's critical. It's critical for some of the questions I'm about to ask. That's the recommended protocol. That's what all of the doctors that say that we should be using this for the, the treatment of COVID SARS-2 are saying. Okay, 400 milligrams loading dose on day one, then four days in a row, we take 200 milligrams, then we stop. Five days, we're done. Okay. Number two, did you know the recommended protocol for COVID treatment is supposed to include zinc on a daily basis as well? Did you know that? Like that is, I'm just asking you yes or no, that that is all of the doctors who say this works, say it is imperative to use zinc along with hydroxychloroquine, that if you don't do that, you will not get the results that you can get if you do. Just, did you know? Yes or no? Simple question. Number three, did you know that not a single published study so far has included supplemental zinc along with the use of hydroxychloroquine? Did you know that? Did you know that, first question, did you know you're supposed to use zinc? Did you know that no study so far has included zinc? Just yes or no question, simple one. Um, so my fourth question for you then is, given that's true, and, and you have to trust me that it is, you can go research it and find out if you doubt me. It's I never, never uh, fault anybody for researching anything that anybody says, let alone myself. But given if that's true, then why has zinc not been included in these studies? Why would you do that? Why would you take a protocol that doctors in the field are telling you works and then say, well, we're only going to test part of it, not all of it? Why would you do that? Okay. Number five, why are we ignoring the fact that hydroxychloroquine is a long-known ionophore for zinc, that this is old science, very old science, we've known this for decades, that hydroxychloroquine in combination with zinc gets zinc inside the cells, and that when zinc is inside your cells, it slows down and impedes viral replication. Why are we ignoring that when we have this discussion? Why doesn't this ever get talked about by people who say hydroxychloroquine doesn't work? Why don't they ever say, well, it does this, but here's why it doesn't do it for COVID SARS-2, COVID-19. Why don't, why don't they even acknowledge this when this is old science? That's another question for you. Um, number six, why have many of these studies intentionally overdosed patients at toxic levels of hydroxychloroquine? The, again, the recommended, that's why I gave you the first one. I gave you the answer to go along with it. The recommended dose for treatment for this illness 400 milligrams on day one and then 200 milligrams a day for four days that's it it's a very small amount of the drug the most recent one that came out used uh, 400 milligrams twice a day 
That's 800 milligrams a day. That's four times the recommended dose. Some of the studies have used up to 2,400 milligrams a day of this medication. There is no doctor anywhere that wouldn't tell you that those types of dosages are potentially toxic and potentially life-threatening. Why have, we, why have these studies that have, have had negative outcomes all involved overdosing our patients? Why? Just why? Okay. Um, my next question, since we know that happened, because the studies actually publish, if you read the studies, and you don't just read the title, because that's what you're looking for, confirmation of your bias. If you read the studies, they tell you the dosages. They tell you the dosages. So given we know that they do this, and they have done this, in almost every study using these patients that were in late stages or severe stages of the in illness, they gave them overdoses. I'm going to ask you a seventh question. Is the intentional overdosing of a patient with any medication ethical? Is it ethical? Yes or no? And then if you say yes, I would like you to explain it. And if you say no, I'd like you to justify why it was done. Either or, right? So that's another question for you. Um, on, on prevention, prophylactic use of hydroxychloroquine, we hear how dangerous this drug is. Did you know that the protective dose necessary to use as a prophylaxis, according to doctors who are doing it, we don't have a study proving this, but it's one 200 milligram uh, pill of hydroxychloroquine every two weeks and daily zinc. Did you know that? That that is the recommended prevention strategy on COVID. And how is that in any way risky? Based on over 67 year, years of use of this drug and its derivatives, that that level of use could ever be risky to anybody on just about any circumstances. Please explain it to me. Okay. Um, how was HCQ considered one of the safest medications we have for over 60 years and yet not often st stated that it, ch why, why are, why is that the case? So we, we have this medication has been safely used for over 60 years by people on an outpatient basis all over the world, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, other things, the prevention of malaria. I personally myself took it for six months on an ongoing basis while I was in Honduras to prevent uh, malaria when I was in the, in the military. The Department of Veterans Affairs gives 67,000 doses of this a day, not in a hospital. Why is that the case? But all of a sudden, all of the experts are warning it should only be used in a hospital under the supervision of a doctor. How can we have a medication that's been used for 60 years safely suddenly need to only be used in a hospital? And are we not still using it on an outpatient basis for all these other conditions right now? Just a simple question. Um, did you know that HCQ is an over-the-counter medication in many nations? That there's countries all over the world where you don't need a doctor, you don't need a prescription, you can just walk in and get this medication in, in just about any store the way you can get aspirin or Motrin in the United States today. And these nations don't have people dropping over and dying of this medication. How can it possibly be that dangerous when it's so freely available throughout the world as an over-the-counter medication. How can we have to use it only in a hospital, right? When a, a person who is going overseas, their doctor will just give them a, a certain quantity of it to take while they're overseas for malaria. But how is it safe for that use, but not safe for the use for COVID SARS-2? What's the difference? Can you explain that to me? When it comes to I know what you're chopping at the bit to tell me. You're about chopping at the bit to tell me about all of these studies that show the dangerous side effects and arrhythmias and things like that. But why are doctors citing studies about dangerous side effects related to hydroxychloroquine when all of those studies are based on extremely long duration use at elevated dosages? How does that correlate to a four day or a five day cycle of using a standard dose? How, how can you take a study where these, these arrhythmias occurred in patients that were using this medication for extremely long duration periods of time at elevated doses and correlate that to this very small, typical use of the drug? Why would anybody do that? Why would you, isn't that just intellectually dishonest 
to say, oh, look, it caused all these arrhythmias. And then you look at the study, and the study was people that used the drug for 10, 20, or 30 years. Some of them had 800 milligrams a, a day, the same dose, overdose dosage that they were giving to these patients. When, when doctors are saying we should be using 200 milligrams for four days, one loading dose of 400, I'm just I'm being I'm being serious here. I'm not I'm not trying to be clever with this. I, I really want if if you can explain that away, if you can explain how it makes sense to use studies about the long term heavy use of a drug to claim that the short duration moderate use of the drug is dangerous, I'd like to know. Is there any study that you can show me that shows the dangers of using hydroxychloroquine for the average person at a dosage of four hundred one day? 200 for four days and stop. A single one. Does it exist? Can you show it to me? If you can show it to me, and there's people somewhere having all kinds of arrhythmias or problems from that, please do. In, including in conjunction with zithromycin. Okay? And zithromycin is another thing on its own individual safety. That, that, that's hide nor hair of what I'm asking about today. But did zithromycin with hydroxychloroquine used for five days at the recommended dosage cause any problems did that I, i'm not aware of it if you can show it to me and you can show it to me in print where it happened not some karen's opinion on facebook i'm i'm more than happy to retract the opinions i've given so far um number 13 or thir 12 yet i'm sorry i don't want to skip ahead why is the character of every doctor that speaks positively of hydroxychloroquine attacked instead of responding to the facts and data that they present why would you do that? Why would, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you say, this man's facts are wrong, here's how? Why would you immediately go to attacking the person versus discussing the data that they're presenting? Now, my opinion on, I want you to give me your own answer, but my opinion on that is we do that when we have already lost the intellectual argument. When somebody brings facts to me and I, I believe that they're wrong, and I have data that will counter those facts. I don't just scream, there's a study over here that says you're wrong. I explain how their facts are incorrect. And then we have a debate. And then we come to a realization that either they're right, I'm right, or the truth lies somewhere in between. But we do that through debate. We don't do that through you're an idiot, or you don't know anything, or you, you, you worship the orange man, or whatever. Right? We do that by discussing the why. Why is the media... And why are people with no understanding of these studies attacking the person instead of discussing the merits of their argument? That brings me to my 13th question. Why haven't we seen a single, well-organized public debate between two informed individuals on both sides of this? Isn't this how we solve problems in science? Isn't this what science is purported to do? You don't say you're an idiot. You don't throw names at each other. You sit down, and when you can't come to a consensus, there's rigorous debate. I've seen many debates on many questions in science with opposing views from different scientists. You have a mo I'm talking about a, a formal debate. Why haven't we seen a single formal debate? You take a scientist or a doctor or a PhD, someone with well-credentialed, that wants to defend the position that this drug is dangerous and should not be used for this purpose, and you get another scientist who says, you're wrong. And then we put them in a room together, or we social distance them and do it remotely. We have a third-party moderator and agreed upon rules of debate, like any debate. And then we hash that out. And then we let other scientists and doctors weigh in on their opinions about the debate that we just saw. We let the public see it. Why hasn't that happened? What possible justification is there for not allowing that debate if it's so clear that the people who are pro-use of this drug are wrong? Why? My last question, why does every argument about this drug, the people that are opposed to it, why do they always invoke Donald Trump? What does Donald Trump have to do with whether a drug works or not? Why is every article that's about hydroxychloroquine in a negative context say Trump's hydroxychloroquine? Hydroxychloroquine goes back to the 1950s. Quinine, which is the, the base of it, goes back to the late 1800s. We've been using some version of this drug since long before Donald Trump was alive. It's not his. Why did they put a picture of Donald Trump on every article that's negative about hydroxychloroquine? Why, if, if it's so obvious that this medication doesn't work, why not leave Trump out of it? 
I mean, I would prefer to. I've never used the fact that Trump thinks this thing works as proof that it works. I think that is a is, a, is an appeal to authority fallacy. There's no there's no validity to Trump's opinion other than anybody else's opinion. I always resort back to the data. I resort back to the doctors who have been using this and reporting the results. I resort back to a study from 2005 by the same people telling you it doesn't work today that said it did in 2005 for the original SARS virus. You can look that study up. I'll put a link in the notes for you. I, I, I defend this position because the science is actually old. They keep telling you COVID SARS-2 is a new novel virus. It's new as a strain, but coronaviruses aren't new, and our understanding of them is not new. And the way that they replicate is through the RNA in our cells. That's how they, that's how they work. We know that. That's what's, and nobody says COVID SARS-2 doesn't do that. We know that when we're given in conjunction with zinc, that hydroxychloroquine works very well as an ionophore to get the zinc in the cells. So that's the debate we should be having. Does that process work? We also know there's two other very important actions that HCQ does that scientists who've done the research claim help protect the lungs and the body from COVID SARS-2. That's the debate. What does that have to do with the orange man? I don't even like the guy myself. Can you answer these questions for me? And here's what I'll say. You know that debate I was talking about? Full disclosure, I do not have a medical degree. I do not have any degree. I am a professional podcaster. I have an open invitation. All of you people out there like, I know six doctors and I talk to them every day. Okay, great. Go talk to them now. Go tell them to come answer my questions. Don't tell them to just scream and yell. Don't tell them to just say he doesn't know what he's talking about. Don't say, oh, there's a study. Because I want to know in that study, why, why did they overdose the patient? Why didn't they include zinc? Why did they give it to late stage patients? Why are you claiming that a medication was safe for 65 years? Right? So since I don't think I'm going to get answers like that, since I, get, I think I'm going to get shrieking and ad hominem attack, I'm going to tell you, you can't ad hominem attack my, my reputation. I'm telling you, I have no professional training here. All I have is an ability to read and understand data. And I'm basing what I have to say on data. But with that said, go get your doctor. Go get your scientist. Go get your PhD. Go get somebody with an MD, a PhD, and a DSC. Go get the most qualified person you can who wants to take the counter position that, number one, hydroxychloroquine is dangerous when used at the levels we're talking about rather than at an overdose. And get a person who also wants to make the case that there is no evidence or no proof or that it's the preponderance of the evidence that HCQ is of no medical use for the prevention or treatment of COVID SARS-2. Go get that person and bring them to me. Bring them to me, and I'll, I'll give you two different ways we can do this. Since I talk to a quarter million people, I'll let them do it. I will bring them on my, on my show. I will ask them these same questions along with others. I will ask them to clarify. I will not attack them or yell at them or shout them down. I will let them be fully heard. But I will push back when the answer doesn't make sense until we can come to an understanding or agree to disagree. And they can talk to my audience. And they can explain why I'm wrong. That is one offer. The other offer, we will find a third-party moderator. And right here on YouTube, and if you're watching it somewhere else, it's on YouTube as well. Right here on YouTube, we'll do a live, if YouTube will allow it, if YouTube won't censor it, a live streaming debate where we'll have equal time and agreed upon terms, and we will debate this in public. You're a PhD, you're a DSC, you're an MD, whatever, right? Okay, and, and I'm nothing. It should be easy. I should be a slam dunk, right? So when you see this somewhere and you start shrieking about how wrong I am and you start shrieking about Trump that has nothing to do with this, go get that person. I, my, my understanding from my audience is that when they, the people post my material on this, they have wives of doctors shrieking at them. Okay, honey, go get, your, go get your husband. Go get him. Tell him to come on my show and explain to me where I'm wrong. Tell him to come explain this to me. Right? Or tell him to debate me. I'll do it either way. And when no one does it, then I have one more question for you. Why won't they? Why will no one legitimately answer these questions and why will no one debate a redneck hippie duck farmer on this subject? How weak is your argument if you're afraid to debate Jack Spirico on a medical topic? I'm just going to say it must be pretty weak. But I stand ready. I stand willing. I stand able.
bring it.